Hello everybody, welcome to the second lecture of the course on construction claims. In this lecture, we will look at the pre-contract stage and how that is important for construction claims. We will look at the program of works and how that is necessary for construction claims. We'll also look at the importance of records and their importance, chronology of documents, how we prepare that. A very important thing that we'll also discuss is the importance of notices of delay and how notices of delay should be written. And then we will summarize the whole lecture and the procedure of claims as per FIDIC guidelines. Let's get started. The first thing we need to understand is what the contract is. The contract is basically the combination of all of the documents that you see on the screen right now. So it's the contract agreement. It is the particular conditions, the general conditions, the specs, the drawings, the BOQ and the other document. The other documents are a really important consideration. What these documents are essentially at the tender stage during negotiations, there are lots of meetings held, minutes of meetings are recorded. There are a lot of emails that go back and forth. So normally the employer tends to dump all of this information into the contract and call it the other document. So care should be taken in analyzing carefully what these other documents are and what the contents of these are. As far as claim are concerned at the pre-contract stage there are four very important things that need to be considered and we should make sure that we try and implement these in the contract agreement so it's the order of precedence the overhead percentage the method of delay analysis and the ownership of the float if these four things are defined properly in the contract, then the job of claim preparation becomes very easy. Let's briefly look at what these four things are. First is the order of preference. The order of precedence is basically a list that defines which document takes priority over what. For example, during execution, you find that there is a conflict between the specifications and the drawings. What wins? Which document should take precedence? What document should we consider? This is exactly where the order of precedence is of importance. So as you can see on the screen, the specs are listed above the drawings. So in this case, the specifications would take precedence. But this is the order listed as per the FIDIC books. Your contract could be slightly different and therefore care should be taken to examine this order of precedence really carefully. And if there is no order of precedence in the contract, you should try and make sure that it is implemented in the contract because it resolves a lot of unnecessary conflicts in the project execution stage. The second thing that needs to be implemented in the pre-contract stage is the overhead percentage. So overhead percentage is basically the percentage of overhead that you are allowed to apply on your variations, your extension of time and any other claim for that matter. So if this OHNP is defined properly at, I don't know, 10%, 12%, 20%, it saves a lot of hassle and you do not have to prove your overhead and profit. We'll discuss this in more detail in the lecture on prolongation cost, which will come in the later part of this course. The next thing we need to ensure is the method of delay analysis is clearly defined. I'm sure you can agree with me here that you have faced these issues that, for example, you did impacted as planned analysis when preparing your claim. But then the engineer asks you to do the time impact analysis and you say that's not possible we can't do it we don't have the resources so if the method of delay analysis is clearly defined in the contract then this resolves this unnecessary conflict and when you know which type of delay analysis method you have to implement you will make sure that you document your records etc etc accordingly during the life cycle of the project and the fourth important thing that needs to be implemented in the contract is to define that who owns the float this is also a point of conflict often because you are often denied your claims because the engineer seems to think that you have the float and then the engineer and the employer consumes all of it and then you argue that the program is mine so the float belongs to me. This is an endless cycle that has happened in almost every project. So if this is defined that float if any how it is meant to be used this will also resolve a lot of conflict and make our lives easier as claimants. The next thing we need to consider is our program. There are two aspects to it. One is the preparation stage and one is the administration or the maintenance stage. During the preparation stage, when you are preparing and submitting your baseline program, four important things should be considered. A, you should make sure that your baseline program is as detailed as possible. The next thing you need to keep in mind is that the baseline program should be a clear guideline of what our intentions are, how we intend to execute the works. So it should list 
as accurately as possible the sequence of the work. The next thing that needs to be considered is the critical path. So the critical path should be very well defined and it should be logical. And the last thing that we need to implement is that the dependencies on the client or the employer they should be clearly clearly defined in the program of works for example you need a drawing from the employer on what day do you need this drawing so as not to impact the project program so if these dependencies are clearly defined in the program of works as claimants it makes our life much much easier because we simply have to analyze the delays against this particular milestone there are many other things that we need to consider when we prepare a program of course but these four things as a claimant are very 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 essential to ensure that our claim is solid and successful so once the program is submitted approved and the project life cycle has started the execution has started there are four important things with regards to the program that need to be ensured a we have to ensure that our program updates are regular as defined in our contract for example your contract requires you to update the program weekly it must be done weekly and sent to the client weekly the next thing we should make sure that we update and report the progress honestly we should not try and report fake progress because when it comes to analyzing your claims if the employer or the third party who are reviewing our claim they realize that we had been reporting fake progress it massively damages our case the next thing we need to do is we need to revise the program as and when required so when your project undergoes changes these changes should be well documented in the program of works and the most important thing is that we should update our baseline program just before the delay event for example today is the 28th of may and there is a delay event that occurs and starts on the 28th of may it will massively help our cause and our claim that if we have a program update available on the 27th of may the next two things like we already discussed is a we should have it well defined that what the method of delay analysis to be used is and the second thing that needs to be defined is the total float and how it is intended to be used by all parties if it is not defined in the contract then i would suggest that at an early stage in the project you sit with the engineer and the employer and come to an amicable agreement on some middle ground the next thing is records i cannot begin to stress how important record keeping is when it comes to construction claims you have to understand that we as a claimant um, the burden of proof lies on us so it is our job to justify and prove the claim and not the employers and the only way this happens is if our records are properly maintained for instance uh, if we look at clause 20.1 of the fiddy credit book it says i'll read it out loud the contractor shall keep contemporary records as may be necessary to substantiate any claim either on the site or another location acceptable to the engineer without admitting the employer's liability the engineer may after receiving any notice under this sub clause monitor the record keeping and instruct the contractor to keep further contemporary records the contractor shall permit the engineer to inspect all of these records and shall if instructed submitted copies to the engineer so it is clearly outlined in the contract that we as a contractor are required to maintain these records it's our job to maintain these records and not the engineers this is of course a clause referred to from fiddy credit book your contract might have a different ish clause but i'm pretty sure that there is a clause in your contract too that ensures that you are required to keep records what could these records be these records could be anything so these could be your progress reports your material delivery records your uh, records of your plant your equipment your logs your program of works your updated programs your variation orders any emails you have sent out minutes of meetings notices of delay um, site instructions photographs with dates etc etc so anything and everything that can prove in writing that something happened is a record and these must be maintained at every stage in the project in my opinion and the opinion of many industry experts the best way to keep these records is a keep the physical copies and b to maintain a log that is the chronology of these records chronology is basically keeping the record of all of your documents in a dated orderly fashion for example on your screen you see a sample of a chronology log it's a simple excel sheet with the date 
the type of notification whether it was an email whether it was a letter or a site memo or any other instruction we mentioned the subject as in what this event was a brief summary of the event in the comment section and we mentioned who this uh, notice was initiated from and who this notice was sent to this little table will go a long 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 way in helping you prove your case and prepare your case in the first place a very important consideration and a factor that needs to be considered while preparing claims is our notices of delay before we dive into what these notices of delay should look like let's first take a look at what FIDIC has to say when it comes to the notices of delay in clause 1.3 FIDIC says that whether these conditions provide for the giving or issue of approval certificates consents determinations notices and requests these communications shall be in writing and delivered by hand against receipt sent by mail or courier or transmitted using any of the agreed systems so basically what FIDIC requires us to do is we have to send these notices print these notices, deliver them by hand to the engineer and take a signature from the engineer. This could be the site office or their head office or any other address or location specified in the contract agreement. Further, clause 20.1 goes to say that if the contractor considers himself to be entitled to any extension of time for completion and any other additional payment under any clause of this conditions or otherwise in connection with the contract, the contractor shall give notice to the engineer describing the event or circumstance giving rise to the claim. The notice shall be given as soon as possible and not later than 28 days after the contractor became aware. So when a delay event occurs and we become aware of the delay event under FIDIC guidelines we have a maximum of 28 calendar days to notify the engineer of these delays what happens if we don't do it in 28 days let's take a look clause 20.1 further goes on to say that if the contractor fails to give the notice of a claim within a period of 28 days the time for completion shall not be extended and the contractor shall not be entitled to additional payment and the employer shall be discharged from all liability in connection with the claim. So basically, if we do not send our notice within the stipulated amount of time, our claim goes out of the window and our entitlement is gone. So it is really, really important to send these notices in time. Now, when we write these notices of delay, we often are, I don't know, emotional because we've just had an argument on site with the engineer and there has been some delay and we come back to the office and type all sorts of nonsense in our notices of delay. When writing a notice of delay, the biggest guideline is to assume that this letter is not meant for the engineer, but this letter is meant for somebody who does not know the project at all. So if a third party, a lawyer or anybody for that matter reads this notice of delay, it should be clear to him without being involved in the project what the event is, that it is a notice of delay and what the impact is. So to do this, five important things should be considered. The first one, it might sound very obvious, is to state clearly that it is a notice of delay. The second thing we need to include is the details of the event. The third thing we need to include is the contractual reference. Which clause of the contract are you referring to in connection to this notice of delay? The fourth thing that you need to include in an NOD is whether you are intending to submit an extension of time or any other claim in regards to this delay or not. And the last thing you need to mention is you have to ask the engineer that does the engineer require any other documents or records to be maintained for this delay event to be recognized. Let's go ahead and use these principles and uh, write a sample notice of delay. You can see it on your screen right now. First of all, in the subject line, it is clear that it is a notice of delay. So, dear engineer, with reference to the above subject, this is to notify you of a delay. So once again, we are making sure that we are making it crystal clear that this is a notice of delay. This is to notify you of a delay that has occurred in the execution of, there you mention what works were happening, etc, etc, as per the terms outlined in our contract. So you mention the reference number of your contract. So as per our checklist, we are required to have five things the first one is checked so we have stated clearly that it's a notice of delay on blah blah date a blah blah event happened which significantly impacted our ability blah 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 so here in this case we check the second point that is we mention exactly what the event was the contractual or legal provisions entitling us to claim for this delay are stipulated in section 
XX of the contract agreement. So the third point is checked. That is, we have mentioned that which clause of the contract entitles us to this claim. As a result of this delay, it is necessary for us to inform you that we feel that we are entitled to both an extension of time and additional payments, blah, 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 blah. So the fourth point is checked that we have mentioned our intent that we intend to claim extension of time and additional payments against this delay. In accordance with the contract requirements, we kindly request that the engineer advise us of any specific records or documentation to be kept regarding this delay. We are committed to maintaining blah, 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 blah. You're sincerely blah, 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 blah. So your fifth point is also checked that you have requested the engineer whether he needs us to maintain any other records or documentation to be able to claim for this event properly. So your fifth point is checked. You have basically asked the engineer, what do you want? Is there anything else you want? So you're basically throwing the ball in his court and asking him that if he requires any other documentation, etc., etc., to be maintained. Simple. This is a simple guide to writing a notice of delay. No emotions whatsoever, straight to the point. And if this notice of delay is read by anyone, I think it will be fairly clear to anyone reading this letter that what the event is, what caused this delay, blah, 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 what contract provisions are. So it checks all the right boxes and is a very, very professional document. So basically under FIDE guidelines, this is how a claim goes. The first thing is a delay event happens. The first responsibility as a contractor is to notify the engineer in due time. In case of FIDIC, it is within 28 days. In your contract, it might be sooner or later. Definitely take a look. The next thing you need to understand is, does your contract require to provide any further or additional notice requirements in reference to this claim. The next thing we need to understand and keep in mind is that we need to maintain all sorts of records necessary and we should ideally try to maintain them in a chronological order. Under FIDIC, once the delay event has occurred and A, our job is to notify the engineer, after notifying the engineer, we basically have 42 days from the date of the delay event to submit a comprehensive claim. So once this claim is done and if this claim is still ongoing, if this delay event is still ongoing, then you are required to provide interim updates to this claim to the engineer and the employer. Once the event is concluded, then you have 28 days under FIDIC to submit the final particulars of your claim. Contract administration is a very complex subject and it's not the scope of this uh, course to delve into all of that. But this lecture was a guideline of how we need to administer contracts specifically with regards to claims. What sort of documents to maintain, what the program should be like, when the update should be sent, when notices should be sent, etc, etc, etc. We are now getting to the business end and in the next lecture we will look at the different types of claim following which we will go into the details of the presentation of claims. Please make sure you take the quiz, the link is in the comment section and I will see you in the next lecture. Sure.